In honor of our launching our new fund six, uh, we've got a very special lineup. We were just talking, actually. We think it may be the first time we've had all three founders on one webinar. So you're a very lucky audience today. I think the first thing that's important to establish is that the bull market run ended in November. It was a very long 13 year run coming out of the financial crisis, which created, I think, a very lax, very liquid environment where both really great companies, but maybe also companies that still have a lot to prove, all were highly valued, all seemed successful. And we're in a, I would say, a time of reckoning where I think we're going to, investors and the stock market at large will sift through these companies at a much more detailed basis to find which are the real category leaders, which are the winners in the long run, and continue to back those companies. And I think for the others that have maybe lived on hyped PowerPoints, it's going to be a struggle. Then to answer your question, have we reached the bottom? Well, kind of the, the near-term macro clouds would indicate that we have not. You, you know, the markets have corrected a lot, particularly unprofitable tech have suffered the most, but also big tech have suffered to quite a decent degree. But we then have to break it into two parts because we see in the B2C market, you know, software advertising, media to consumers, there is real demand weakness. So the inflation is impacting that, the war is impacting that, the rising energy prices is Im impacting that. It reduces the wallet for the average consumer, which impacts for real. So there I think we have a long way to go to find that bottom. Uh, the story in the B2B market, particularly in last week's you know, reporting season, has actually been quite strong. So Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe all reported on or better than expected and pretty high expectations to go with that, showing that there's real robust demand in industry. And I would argue that one of the best things to do in industry in an inflationary environment is invest in software to reduce your cost of production so that you become less exposed. So it's a bit of an anti-inflation play B2B software. So I think we're going to see the market operate in two halves probably for the next, next few months. But it may also very well be so that we will see a couple of false bottoms. So I, I think now is a very good time to be quite conserv conservative as an investor pull the trigger only with the greatest care and, and in companies that are either profitable right now or where their core geography or business is profitable and the losses you're making are calculated losses rather than making losses to prove that a technology works. I think that what we've discovered since 2000 when we started the business, Ben, is that all tech is not created equal. I mean, when we started out, if you remember, technology, everybody in technology felt the same, even though the underlying business models, the underlying hardware, the software was entirely different. So I think what's really interesting about this latest correction is whether investors are going to be smart enough to differentiate between a computer games business, an enterprise software business, and a telecoms company. Because in 2000, they certainly weren't. In yeah. 2008, eight nine, I would say so-so. Yeah. And, and time will tell. Because there's no doubt now that, in some ways, technology is an entirely meaningless phrase. I mean, if you're not a technology business, you're not a business. Yeah. So, so really, it's incumbent now, I think, on investors to, to truly understand what these businesses do. Because the days of when all technology companies are 10 times revenues or 20 times revenues, I mean, that... That's gone. But another area that I think is very important to talk about right now is that the, the lockdown periods that are still ongoing in parts of Asia has created an enormous supply chain glut. And actually for the semiconductor industry in all its part of that value chain, this is a real positive. I mean, we have seen reports out from ASML in Holland, from Kalen Tenkor in US, TSMC, where I mean, they are giving upward guidance on their revenue projections for 2023, 24, and 25, because all their production is fully sold out. So, so yes, you know, we see, for instance, media tends to follow a lot the digital media side of tech, right? Companies like, say, Netflix and Spotify and so forth. 
and that's a bloodbath mm -hmm. because that's where it's very easy to stop using the service. It's not essential. But if semiconductors are not being produced, cars will not run, trains will not run, planes will not fly, washing machines will not wash. So again, coming back to how broad our market is, and I think our what's upon us, and I think the luck we have with the size and breadth of organization we, we have is we have people in the firm who really understand various of these areas in absolutely the greatest detail. So that instead of being a tech investor or tech group, we can focus on the areas where there is continued strong demand. And that, that gives us a way to operate both in, in bull market and, and in more bearish environments. So I think a lot of people come to us and say, how should we react? How do we set up for this? And I think my advice is always, you never waste a good crisis. There's always opportunity. There's always deals to be done. And what we've seen in the valuations come down in the public markets, the buyout funds will take those companies private. There's, there's a screaming opportunity. Some of the valuations have come down so much and the buyout funds are looking at that. They've been waiting for this because mm. they can finally acquire a fantastic software company that's growing 50% with great retention, low churn, all the dynamics they've been looking for and very clear visibility on the history. They're now able to acquire that for the first time in many, many years. What we are trying to do is to find the best software product in every category, whether it's in you know, finding the next you know, RDNA vaccine or helping people with HR or entertaining with a computer game. If we at core know the company is developing the best product, it will survive good and bad times. So I, you have to come back to the fundamentals. I mean, we're in the entrepreneur's game, in the innovation game, and, and that takes a long time. So as long as you have GDP growth, plus or minus two or three percent. I mean, the businesses that we're backing over five to ten years should be successful. I mean, this isn't a macro play. This isn't econ economics, a GDP, GDP play. This is a play about finding these superstar software founders and giving them a capital and the support to allow them five or ten years to build a fantastic business. 20 years ago, the strategic framework for what we hoped the group would become, and, and that's what we call the entrepreneur's clock. So this is all about putting the entrepreneur right in the center of everything that we do, and then spending as much time as we can to build financial products and services around those founders. And I think we've now worked with 27 companies that have hit that billion dollar mark, and then seven have gone on to hit that $10 billion mark. And we've always been kind of trying to, as a firm and a team say keep raising the ambition levels we, we don't need to sell at 100 million initially now we can build to a billion now 10 billion now really what we're thinking and we, we like setting these big missions because this is what we've learned from the unicorns that we've worked with is to say we've got to set this very aggressive and large mission and then we have this very talented team that pretty much always figures out how to get there. And I think you can over, you can over complicate strategy sometimes, but it's choosing those big missions that really mean something to the organization as a whole. And I think we've selected those in, in good order. We're also a technology company. It's true that the interface is human to human, but behind our decision making, behind our choices of investment is reams and reams of data. And that means our industry, just like the hedge fund industry, I would say before the venture and growth industry, really turning into a software industry in its own right. So size starts to matter in a big way. I mean, we notice the more people we have on the ground collecting data that goes into our data plane, the value of the data plane doesn't grow linearly, it grows exponentially with that. I mean, we see every start up and scale up in the European and UK markets today, we see probably more than 60% in the US market. And that completeness gives a much better ability to operate. It allows us, for instance, to, to be truly thematic. What I mean by that is at any, any given time, we are really only pursuing four or five different themes within the software internet space. And we can allow ourselves to do that because we, we operate truly globally and we have a full map. We can see every company in the space and we have access to them. And then when we look at some of the opportunities further afield, I guess as, as founders now, 
we want to have the benefits of that scale. So we, we've got the data edge, the data advantage. But then one of the really important things is to have the soul of a startup. And this is what we've learned from some of the, the best entrepreneurs. And so Hugh has been driving a lot of that on our side and keeping it collegiate, keeping it very entrepreneurial. And I think that's going to be one of our key man management challenges over the, over the next 10 years as well. And if the entrepreneur is in the heart of our business uh, and the heart of great investing and great stock picking, then, then surely we need to make sure we've got the right people in the firm. And for us, they need to have two critical characteristics, Ben. I mean, the first is that they have to have a real passion for technology. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean they need to be a programmer in C++. I mean, I, I certainly can't do that. But, but they need to believe passionately in the power of technology to bring about positive change in the world. And, and we really, really believe that. And, and everybody that joins this firm believes that. Like, well, that's not an overnight success. It takes time. And there are a whole, a whole bunch of bumps and pitfalls along the way. But you need to believe. You need to be passionate about that. And the second thing, just picking up Manish on what you said, we were saying about the soul, is, is you need to have an empathy for what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Because, you know, as you were saying, Pei, it's desperately lonely up there. I mean, you start these businesses and everybody tells you you're going to fail. Your partners at home tell you you're going to fail. Your family, everybody you try to hire doesn't think it's going to be a success. But, but you need to have a supporter alongside you. So you need to have an empathy for what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And so we try to hunt out these characters that somewhere in their past at university or their parents or their uncle had a business. So they, they really understand that. Arrogance has no place in great stock picking, in my opinion. We operate in an unlevered industry. We are probably the only industry in the world where this is good <laughs> news, not bad news. I mean, the big tech companies are the largest holders of cash outside of you know, sovereign funds on the planet. Even mid-sized venture and growth technology companies, the best of them have all raised very large amounts of capital in anticipation of a market mm. turn. Because just as Hugh said, I think for us in the industry, we have been waiting for this turn to come for quite a long time. So people, the best founders, have taken precaution around that. Our colleagues at you know, Silver Lake, Sequoia, Carlisle, they have all raised very large new funds, unlevered funds. These are not levered funds. So it's cash going into companies with cash, with no leverage. So if anything, you know, the return on this equity goes up when you also start getting interest on the cash you're holding. Yeah. And you're not exposed to inflation nearly in the same way. It's very important when one considers investing in our fund is we do not invest in what I define as future technology. So we are not, we are analyzing the metaverse, AR, quant computing, uh, all sorts of things, right? But we only invest once an industry is actually a real revenue generating industry with either millions of consumers that are demanding it or thousands of enterprises or government entities that need it. So, so we are an investor in our, what I would say mature uh, software and internet companies. I mean, if you think about the Gartner hype curve at the kind of first end of the curve where many of our colleagues operate, which is super exciting, and you can make fantastic returns. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we follow that with great interest. We then see kind of uh, the peak of that and how it comes down and often comes down quite a lot. And at that time, we find that it really tests the metal of the entrepreneurs uh, and the top 10, 20% survive and come out a lot stronger. And at that point of proven strength with a proven strong underlying market, we want to enter. That means that we are quite late stage bias. I mean, these companies are typically rather large, but it's not because we focus on a stage, it's because we focus on that aspect of resilience. We've heard that the best vintages are often created after a crisis, so I think the timing could be really interesting. Um, we're gonna have a first close on Fund 6 on June the 16th. And, you know, the last fund was heavily oversubscribed, so do bear that in mind. But we do want you on this journey with us again, and I think you can see that we see opportunity in the market right now. Uh, not necessarily a time to be cautious, but uh, that's why we're moving forward.